The director uh, of the Centre for European Reform and Independent Think Tank, Charles Grant, is going to introduce a panel to you on how Europe's going to cope. We're all focused on what's going on here. The Europeans have to figure out how to reset, how to fix, how to make good, and how to carry on now without the UK. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about that, obviously, with the wider impact of the recent French elections, German elections coming up. And after Ian, uh, we're going to talk about people again. We're going to talk about this populist insurgency that we're hearing and reading about all the time. The way we live, the very nature of people seems to be changing from one of ideas, one of debate, what we've come here to do, to one of shouting and one of extremes. And we need to try and figure out how to rein that in and bring a bit of intelligence back. So that's going to be an amazing session as well. For now, though, I'll bring Charles Grant to the stage. Do we have Charles Grant and his panel? Thank you very much. Give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you. That's right, extremity. Extreme right. Exact. Okay, well, is the EU going to make it? That's what we're going to talk about today. And let me, before I put a few questions on the table, let me just introduce uh, our great panel we have today. Starting on my left, Richard Corbett, uh, Deputy Leader of the Labour MEPs in the European Parliament and Vice Chair of the European Movement, former advisor to Herman van Rompuy, uh, Joseph Garcia, <coughs> Deputy Chief Minister of Gibraltar, and the person in charge of Brexit in the Gibraltar government. Uh, Louise Rowntree on my immediate uh, left, uh, candidate in Fulham, uh, for the Liberal Party and a well-known lobbyist in, in Brussels, an expert on the EU. On my right, uh, Laurent Pesch, a professor of EU law at Middlesex University. And finally, Frederick Martel, a writer and a journalist who covers globalization and much else in what he talks about. Um, the, as has just been said, the British debate on Brexit tends to be a debate that ignores what's going on in the rest of the EU. And I hope we can plug that gap somewhat in the next 45 minutes. Uh, let me just put a few questions on the table and ask our panelists to pick up just one of these questions each without any speeches before I open it to the floor. And the first question, I think probably I'm looking at Louise on this, is can the EU simply survive the uh, mass onslaught of different problems it faces, particularly Brexit, but also the Euro crisis, uh, the refugee crisis, the crisis of values in Central Europe, the impact of Trump and so on? Is the, is, is the EU going to make it? Is the EU going to make it? Uh, secondly, I have a particular question on Emmanuel Macron, uh, probably initially uh, for Frédéric. Uh, is, is Macron going to succeed in reforming the French economy? And as a result of that, will he have the credibility to go to Berlin and say, look, uh, Angela Merkel, if you're going to win the next election, and you probably will, look, uh, you need to help us. I'm reforming France. You need to help us by moderating your austerian policies that have damaged the Eurozone so badly. Uh, and are you, going to are you going to shift policy on the Euro? Uh, thirdly, um, thirdly uh, the refugee crisis. Um, it remains quite acute. The numbers flowing across the, uh, the, the, uh, the Mediterranean from North Africa into Italy are not diminishing. There's a serious risk that the eastern route from Turkey across the Aegean may open up again if the Turks get fed up with the EU refusing to uh, give Turkish citizens visa-free access. So that Turkish deal which stemmed the flows across the Aegean could unravel. In the long run, it's hard to imagine that the numbers of refugees try and, uh, and economic migrants trying to get into the EU is going to diminish. This is creating great divisions amongst the member states, uh, particularly between Germany, which has a lot of refugees, and Poland and Hungary, and others that refuse to take any huge divisions amongst the member states, like the, like the Eurozone crisis, which is creating divisions, and like the Eurozone crisis, the refugee crisis is boosting populism and helping those who want to argue that the EU is a bad idea. Uh, next point, number four, European values very much under threat in Poland and Hungary, where the governments are not behaving in the way that EU governments should behave with regard to independence of judiciary and media freedom. And linked to that, the impact of Donald Trump uh, on on the European Union. Is Trump going to create more solidarity amongst the European governments, make them feel uh, that they have things in common in the way they react to Trump? Or is he going to work with those who share his rather authoritarian and illiberal values, perhaps in some member states and those around the EU in countries like Turkey and Russia to undermine European uni unity? And finally, of course, we mustn't forget Brexit itself. Um, and what I note at the moment is that there is a strange, unholy, convergence of interests 
between some in the British government, or at least the British Conservative Party, who do not want a deal, who hope we crash out with no deal at all, because any deal will mean some subjugation to the rules coming out of Brussels and the courts in Brussels. They'd rather have no deal at all and hang the economic cost, and, uh, and they're quite happy for us to crash out. And then equally, one or two people on the European side who apparently seem to be behaving in such a way to make the likelihood of us crashing out rather larger. Just last week, the EU side raised its demands for a Brexit fee, a budget payment, from around 60 billion euros to a substantially higher sum than that. And certainly on the EU side, which I monitor very closely, the demands of the EU are getting tougher and rougher and stronger rather than softer as the negotiations begin. So that's a lot of questions on the table. That's enough from me. Louise, would you like to pick up my first question? Is can, can the EU simply survive this onslaught from so many areas? Well, I mean, you do paint quite a bleak picture, Charles, of the future, and I agree with you that Europe does face challenges. Uh, Brexit may be one of them. I would argue that actually Brexit is quite a small challenge for Europe because Europe's been around now for many decades, and if you look at what it's achieved already, because the question is, will Europe survive? Well, it, it already is surviving. Now, 70 years of peace is not a small thing. I was around. <laughs> my, my late father fought in the Second World War, and when I grew up and I was young in the 80s, we were constantly being bombed because there were challenges involved with uh, the UK and Ireland. And those challenges don't exist anymore for various reasons, but partly because of the EU. Um, Europe is also now the largest single trading bloc uh, in the world, uh, and it operates with considerable, despite, again, many challenges, economic might. Um, and the last thing I would say is that we have, Europe has incredibly strong uh, institutions which are in my opinion, very democratic and almost more democratic than British ones. So it's perfectly... <laughs> so it's, it's in a very good position to deal with all of these challenges. I mean, I remember when the European Parliament wasn't directly elected, now it is by proportional, proportional representation. That's how MEPs like Richard Corbett have been able to do so much good work from all the different political parties. And yes, it is a shame that Britain will be leaving the EU, and I think it will be a loss to the EU because Britain has always had some of the best politicians and diplomats and negotiators in the EU. But, and this is a big but, there will still be 435 million EU citizens out there. There will still be a European Parliament, a European Commission, 27 EU member states, and they are and I know this because I've advised, I've advised some of them and I've also advised uh, a number of Balkans uh, countries who are waiting desperately to join. They are more than aware of just how powerful and successful and strong the EU is now. Right. So to answer your question, yeah. yes, it will survive. Good, glad to hear it. Um. Frédéric, uh, is Macron too good to be true? Can he really pull off a reform of France and a, ref a reform of the EU as well through a renewed Franco-German partnership? Well, first of all, sorry for, for my accent in English. Uh, but I have a, an excuse. I come from a country where, uh, a country which has a new president uh, who at very least very speaks good. better English than the president of the United States of America. <laughs> uh, the election we just uh, had Everybody keeps saying to us, it's not gonna work. were an election with two rounds. If you look at the second yeah. round, yeah. it's a very big victory without, for without, France, without for Europe, of course for Macron, and this victory, as you know, has been 63 for Macron and 34, not even 34, for Marine Le Pen. So it's a huge victory. But if you look at the first round, two weeks before, and you look at the different component of the vote, I'm not going to go on the details, but Macron, a part of Fillon, let's say, among people, were for 
Europe were for, in a way, a modern country and globalization. It is less than 40%. Which means that if you look at the other side, Le Pen, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the extremely left, a part of Fillon, and probably Dupont-Aignan, you have more than 54, 55, 56% of the French population that basically was in a kind of French Brexit as well. So I wouldn't be as optimistic about the French situation, even though for now we can, be, we can say in a safe way that for the next five years we are pretty safe about okay. Europe, globalization, and um, the, the French situation. To answer your question then quickly, Emmanuel Macron is a question mark. We don't know actually, nobody knows exactly what he's going to do. Um, what we can say is that on three key issues, Europe, globalization, and Islam, which are three extremely difficult topics in France, he has been against populism. He took extremely quiet and smart position on this free issue. We will have love that somebody like David Cameron or Ed Miliband will have been as quiet and smart on this kind of free issues. We will be probably in another situation if um, it would have, would have been done in this way. To finish, I will say, you know, I grew up as a European. I was in 89 in Romania, as in the French embassy. I see the, the reconciliation with the east of Europe. So I became, I wasn't in the beginning a European. I became a European. And when you remember, for example, the sentence of Oscar Wilde, when he says in the picture of Dorian Gray, I wonder if life has still in store for me anything as marvelous. I don't know if we have something as marvelous as the European idea. Can we find something else? Can we save Europe? I still think that, I still think that today the European, the European dream is absolutely impossible to defend, to embrace, to support even in France right now, for many reasons. And in UK, we, we are in a bit in the, what the Polish people are saying about uh, difficult things. They say it is easier when you have the fish to make the soup than to recreate the fish from the okay. soup. And this is probably a little bit the UK situation. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Richard, the refugee crisis has been uh, very difficult for the EU to cope with. It probably had some impact on the result of the British referendum on EU membership because the way it was portrayed was the EU is out of control, it can't cope, it's divided. Is there a way forward? Do you think the EU is going to cope and sort out the refugee crisis? Well, the first thing to say about the refugee crisis is that it would be with us whether we had the European Union or not and whether we are in the European Union or not. The stream of people coming from Syria and other places would exist and is not going to suddenly stop miraculously overnight. So it's, whether we like it or not, a common problem that, the, that at least the 27 or the 26 countries on the mainland of Europe have to face together, have to work together. Now that's not easy, as you said in your introductory comments, there are some very divergent views about this. But nothing can be done in terms of solving that problem or managing that issue without working together. And that's one of the glues that holds the rest of the, the European Union together is interdependence, the kind of issues that you cannot simply solve alone in one country, where you have to work together with your neighbors, whether it's refugee crisis, whether it's economic questions, environmental ones, um, the single market, all kinds of things require common action. And that's what mean, makes the European Union 
holds together. Not just the idealistic vision, which you rightly recalled, peace and stability in Europe, that's the main motivation, but also the pragmatic reality that you hang together or you hang separately. Yes, that's at world level. Right, okay, Richard, thank you very much. Let me, let me turn now to Joseph. Um, you are the Deputy Chief Minister of Gibraltar, and Gibraltar is one of the key issues in the Brexit negotiations, which could be an issue that blocks the whole thing, because the Spanish government's taken a very hard line, a very hard line on, on this. Um, uh, it says, for example, that the airport, which it claims is not built on Gibraltar proper, and that is not built on land legally owned by the British, uh, is going to be a particularly difficult issue, it, because as everybody knows, aviation is one of the key difficulties of the Brexit negotiations. If Britain wants to stay in the single market for aviation, like Norway and Iceland are in the single market, they'll have to accept rulings of the European Court of Justice. Any aviation deal, any special provisions with the British will need Spain's consent, and it says it will not give such consent unless the British agree to uh, share sovereignty over Gibraltar, which obviously the British don't want to do, and I'm sure your government doesn't want to do. So do, do, are, you, are you worried that your own little rock may actually uh, be, end up being one of the most important and difficult issues in the entire Brexit negotiation? Well, let me say, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be able to participate in this debate, and it's very welcome also to see the issues that uh, affect the UK and Gibraltar being, being debated in this way. Gibraltar uh, voted massively to remain in the European Union we, by 96%, so we were the largest voting area uh, that voted remain uh, in the referendum last year. <laughs> and there were a number of reasons for that. I think people, first of all, feel very much pro-European, very much part of a wider European project. The protection provided by European Union law against a hostile and uh, difficult neighbor has been very useful. We've been able to take things to court or to complain to the European Commission. There is a, a mechanism there of appeal. And that may be lost going forward once uh, Brexit happens and once we leave the European Union. So obviously, we do face challenges. There are, there are challenges and complications everywhere, including here. But I think we have the additional level of challenges and complications added on by what I would call the, the Spanish uh, dimension. And these raise the head in aviation. I mean, G Gibraltar Airport uh, has been entitled to be included in European civil aviation legislation since we joined in 1973. Spain started to object in 1986 when they joined uh, the European Union. And then we, we signed an agreement in 2009 between the UK, Spain, and Gibraltar to unblock the whole thing, whereby we agreed to build an air terminal next to the front fence, which Spain could then build a connecting building on their side and use it to access our, our, our terminal. Unfortunately, that, um, the Spanish terminal was never built and the new Spanish government rescinded from the agreement that the predecessor had signed up to. Mm -hmm. So it has left aviation as one of the pending issues which haven't been addressed and which now need to be addressed in the discussions going forward. But obviously there are others, and one of them relates to freedom of movement. The border between Gibraltar and Spain is one where 12,000 people come in to work every morning and go back every evening. 10 million tourists come in through that border every year. It means that whereas in the UK immigration is, has been an issue and freedom of movement is an issue, it's not an issue in Gibraltar. We actually cannot operate without 12,000 frontier workers who come in every day to work. And that is one of the issues that will need to be sorted out going forward. And, and our perspective is obviously different to the UK perspective because here immigration and freedom of movement is an issue, whereas in Gibraltar immigration and a fluid land border is actually not an issue. It's something we actually welcome and encourage because obviously it helps not just our own economic development but also the economic development of the Spanish side. Okay. There are 12,000 people who come in to work every day. It's a very real right. and a very human problem. Thank you very much. We'll come back to that later. I'd like to finally turn to Laurent Pechno. Um, European values are under threat within the European Union in certain member states, outside it in the Balkans, in Turkey, in Russia, and arguably uh, Western values are under threat in Washington as well. Uh, what, what should or could the EU be doing about it that it's not going to do about it? Is it going to survive this onslaught on its values? And is the, will the arrival of Macron help the EU to fight to maintain and preserve European values? Uh, before answering your question, just a quick point on Brexit. Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, as a lawyer, perhaps uh, one of the key messages I'd like to uh, share with you is to make uh, a success of Brexit. I think we should stop being in denial by the complexity of what's ahead of us. Uh, as a lawyer, I can tell you that perhaps what's striking me and what gets me the most worried about Brexit uh, 
uh, is not uh, the survival of the EU, it's the survival of the UK. And I think to make a success of Brexit, uh, the, the UK government should start embrace, embracing the complexity of it and not essentially coming clean also about the trade-offs we will have to make. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a painful, a very complex process and perhaps the most uh, the aspect which gets me the most worried uh, is, for instance, uh, the unwillingness to come clean about the, complex, the complex work. As a lawyer, I can tell you that it's going to be a massive challenge to untangle the links between the UK and the EU. Just a, a, a personal issue, just a, a, the status of EU citizens in the UK. I read somewhere that the UK government is of the view that it can be sorted out in one dinner. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, s the sooner we come clean about how complex it is, the, the most likely we're going to make a success of Brexit. Uh, as, as certainly, I, would, I wish for Brexit to be a success, if only for personal reasons, as an EU citizen working and residing in the UK. I would certainly very much like for my uh, immigration status to be sorted out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Now to uh, uh, finally answer your question, Values, sorry for, yes. uh, for the okay. preliminary remark, I just fine. wanted to make this point. Yes. Um, in fact, yes, uh, I think the, I'm not worried, as far as the EU is concerned, I'm not really worried uh, uh, from the point of view of Brexit. I think uh, the, uh, I'm more worried about the UK surviving the challenge of Brexit than the EU surviving the challenge of Brexit. However, I'm worried about the EU's future when it comes to democratic and rule of law backsliding in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, it's a bit of a complex uh, issue, but uh, very briefly, in countries like Hungary and Poland, governments, on the basis of being democratically elected, have decided to undermine the rule of law to implement uh, their programs. Uh, this, is a, this is a crucial issue, uh, if only because the EU legal system is based on one key assumption, is that all of the EU member states share the same values. Once you have an EU member state undermining systematically the rule of law, then you, you're putting the, the survival of the EU legal system becomes under threat. Uh, just to give you an example, the EU legal system is based on the principle of mutual trust. Mutual trust means essentially British judgments uh, can be easily enforced in countries like Romania and Bulgaria, but this, the opposite is true as well. But once you get, uh, once a government has destroyed its judiciary, then you can no longer trust the judgments issued by this national judiciary. You cannot no longer trust the country to implement effectively its EU law obligations. So this is very much, I think, the most pressing issue from the point of view of the EU. This is an existential threat, more so than Brexit itself. Now, what do we do? What should we do? I mean, I know what we should do, uh, but what is possible to do is a bit more of a problem. Essentially, the EU doesn't have really the tools, the effective tools, to actually uh, prevent rule of law backsliding from happening in the first place. The only card we could use, but it wouldn't be easy to use, is to cut off EU funding in countries like Hungary and, uh, and uh, Poland. The most uh, annoying aspect, uh, from my point of view, is that you can, uh, solidarity must work both ways. Uh, you cannot be a recipient of EU funding and refusing to share the burden when solidarity uh, is needed. So we were talking about the refugee crisis. Uh, essentially, Hungary, just to speak of one of the two countries most uh, affected by rule of law backsliding, was asked to uh, uh, welcome about 2,000 refugees. And instead of welcoming 2,000 refugees, they decided to build fences, uh, for right or wrong reasons, but they also decided to challenge the legality of the measure whereby they were asked to uh, welcome 2,000 refugees. 2,000 refugees for a country like Hungary, when the rest of Europe welcomed so many of them in 1956, I think it's quite a disgrace. Yeah, okay. Now, what should be done? I would not advise to, to cut off EU funding. I would hope that we could find an, uh, some sort of political okay. agreement, okay. but that's not possible. So I think what's most likely to happen is when the e UK is gonna leave uh, the EU, then the EU budget is going to have to be renegotiated. There will be less money to be uh, essentially allocated to Eastern European countries, and I'm afraid what we're going to see is simply uh, less uh, EU funding to the poorest regions of Europe, which will be certainly uh, not the best solution, but the most realistic outcome of what we're looking at. Thank you very much, Laurent. Um, before I ask people... 
if I ask people on the floor to put up their hands, which I will do in just a minute, I just, let me just try and pick up, uh, following on from what Laurent said in the first part of his answer about Brexit, and answer my own question I posed at the beginning to some degree. Uh, the Brit Britain's partners are taking a very hard line, but people in this country don't really understand why, because the newspapers don't necessarily tell them why. Why are our partners taking a hard line? Why are they asking for more and more money as the price of Brexit? There's at least a couple of reasons why they're taking a hard line, particularly France and Germany, but the others too. Uh, the, one reason is that is they're very worried about populism. They're very worried that if the British are seen to get a special deal allowing to be in parts of the single market but not other parts, a special privileged position half in, half out, then Marine Le Pen will, or other populists in other countries will point to the Brits and say, look at the Brits, they're thriving outside the EU. They're doing fine outside. Why should we stay in? Let's go and join them. And this is very, very important for Angela Merkel and I'm sure uh, Emmanuel Macron too, certainly it was for the previous French government. Um, Brexit must not be seen to pay. The British must be seen to be less well off outside the EU than in. And when you say to German politicians and officials, as I have done recently, yeah, but come on, if there's a hard deal or a crash, you'll lose some trade with Britain. They say, well, tough. We lose a bit of trade, but what we care much more about, the survival, the authority, the strength, the unity of the EU and its institutions. And we in Britain seldom understand that. There's a second and particular recent reason why they're upping the ante and asking for more. They're just fed up with the British government. Um, they really are, because uh, they, 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 it's nine months since the referendum. And the British government has not yet developed a proper sense of reality. Uh, and we had, we've had nine months to get ready. And when they talk to British officials and more important British ministers, they, they find that the British have not really understood what is at stake. The British government is not listening to experts. It's got a culture of, 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 of conformism and people are, around the prime minister and other ministers are not willing to point out to her that there are painful choices to be made. So when Mr. Juncker had dinner with uh, Mrs. May recently, and when Mr. Tusk, the European Council President, had a dinner with her also recently, which didn't leak out that one, they were really quite surprised to hear what she was saying. She was saying things like, we can do a free trade agreement in the next two years before we leave the EU. And anybody who's ever negotiated a free trade agreement knows they take years and years to negotiate and ratify. She said, we can sort out the issue of EU citizens in a couple of weeks, which of course, it's a very difficult and complex legal situation, the rights of EU one citizens. One meeting, I think I read. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or two, two weeks or one meeting, uh, depending on who you talk to. So there is a, the, the, our partners believe that the British government is out of touch with reality. They're getting frustrated. And that is why they are, perhaps regrettably, and I say this, it's not a desirable, they are upping the ante and increasing the risk of a hard Brexit. But that's enough from me. Who'd like Charles, to... Can yes. I, yes, Richard. May I agree with you on your second point? Yes. But I would nuance the first point. I don't think they're being particularly hardline with Britain. Mm -hmm. Donald Tusk, the president of the European Council, that's all the heads of government together, yes. apart from saying it's a very sad day for Europe that we are leaving, he said, the very fact of leaving is punishment enough. We don't need to do anything to punish Britain, to make an example of Britain to the rest of Europe. You're inflicting this on yourself by your choice, and the people will see in other countries what it means. But he, he is, that is, of course, correct, Richard, but it's also true that I, one Commission official said to me recently, we've increased the Brexit bill from 60 to 100 billion because we're fed up with Mrs May's behaviour. That's yeah. what he said to that's me. That's Commission officials. Yeah. If you look yeah. at the 27 member yeah. states, and that's the bottom line, yeah. they don't take this revenge view. Let's hope not. Who'd like to con contribute from the floor? Um, we have some roving microphones. Uh, let's the, 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 the lady... The, okay. Yes, oh, you come, okay. the, the lady here. Yes, okay. And could you please say who you are and keep your points brief? We'd be very grateful. Thank you. Sanders uh, Fisher from Oxford. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, to the Europeans, make us an offer we can't refuse. And when I say that, I'm not talking about ending freedom of movement. We need to really seriously think about making freedom of movement work for everybody, young and old whether they're working or not, there are ways to get around this so that where they pay their benefits ends up you know, paying for their benefits in another, in another state. We need to think creatively. We need to take this moment and make it a chance to, you know, to, to, to do a different deal. And if we go to Europe and say, we don't want an end to freedom of movement, what we want is freedom of movement that works for everybody, and we want 
a, a basically an enhancement of freedom okay. of movement. Okay, thank you. Let's take several points before we come back to Paris. The lady here. Uh, hello, this is to do with, with movement. Could you say who you are, please? Uh, I'm Therese Melville. And um, what do the panel think about uh, an idea thrown by an MEP about giving all European 18-year-olds a three-week Eurorail pass? Mm. Okay. Okay, and the gentleman here. Uh, John Bloomfield from Birmingham. Um, I, I want to take issue with something that Frederick said, and it's about how we frame this debate, because the reality is that for all the states, nation states of Europe, economics has sprung beyond the nation state border. Um, Marine Le Pen wants to uh, reject that concept. She frames the debate as nationalism against globalization, and she makes it out as if globalization has only one form, which is, if you like, the Blairite form of wild neoliberal globalization. Progressives will lose, like we did in the United States, if we don't challenge that and show that there's an alternative form of globalization, which recognizes economic realities, but is shaped by social, environmental, and other concerns. And it just seems to me that we mustn't fall into the Le Pen trap. And that's why Charles's question, which was, can Macron convince whoever is in charge in Berlin to drop heavy austerity and bully boy tactics on southern Europe is so crucial to the future of Europe. So we need to change the economic policies of Europe, otherwise the attractions of Le Pen style nationalism will spread. Good point. Uh, lady here. Hi. Hi, my name is Gail Irvin. I worked in Brussels in 2012 and I am a passionate pro-European. So. What I want to ask the panel, though, people who are out and about in Brussels very much now and understand the mood of the moment, when I was in Brussels, there was also a, a huge litany of problems that everyone is very, very aware of that need to be, to be tackled head on. There was Ireland, Greece, lots of huge amounts of problems with the Eurozone. There is a, such a heightened awareness in Brussels that they need to push through to solutions, but obviously trying to reconcile national interest with 27, 28 member states and the common good is very difficult. Do, do, does anyone on the panel see a real chance for renewal and for acceleration of actually meeting these issues and coming to a new consensus in Europe, which is, feels fairer for European citizens? Can Brexit be something which actually spurns renewal in, in the European Union? Could it be a good thing for the rest of the member states? Fair, fair question. Uh, let's take several more points on the floor. Lady here. Hi. Carol Tan. Oh. Oh. Hi. Former Labour MEP. Some people have written this week that Martin Schulz is probably arguably the most important person in Europe. He needs to be arguing for a change in German economic policy that supports what Macron is going to have to do in France, which is very, very difficult, structural reform. There needs to be higher wages, more investment, higher internal demand to actually receive, for example, more French imports, but at a European level, to have more money in a European infrastructure zone and support Macron on how he'd like to change Euro governance. Do all your experts see any chance of that? Is Martin arguing that in the campaign? Thank you. Okay, gentleman here. Uh, Tom Lyons from Brighton. Um, I'd like to make a comment on Charles Grant's uh, thing about uh, attitudes towards Britain in the EU. Um, I think the rest of the EU has had 30 years and more to get absolutely fed up with this country's behavior. It's repeated, repetitive petulance and obstructionism uh, under successive governments and also the behavior in the European Parliament of the members of at least one party, which has been <laughs> quite obnoxious and, and given an extremely bad image of this country to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. <clears throat> That being said, I think it's extremely important in an event like this to have people like Laurent Pesch and Richard Corbett who, who do have an understanding of how things are seen on the other side of the channel. We are an island, we are an insular nation. I think we are more insular than we've ever been in my lifetime now. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'd like to ask, uh, pick up something that Laurent Pesch said uh, about trade-offs which might come out of the negotiations. I'm wondering how many there can be because one of the delusions that the British political establishment and the British media 
uh, seem to be under is that we have some kind of bargaining power in, this, in these negotiations. We don't. We have absolutely none. Because of the way that Article 50 is set up, we are in the position of supplicants. As someone put it the other day, it is as though it, we're back to the position we were before 1973, when we are asking the EU to do something for us. They don't have to agree. So what kind of trade-offs can there be? Looking again at something quite recent, mm -hmm. the way that the EU behaved towards Greece recently, can we expect any okay. trade-offs at all from the rest of the EU? Sorry for going on a bit. Thank you. Um, let's take one more before we come back to our panel, then we'll take more questions later. And if the organisers can let me know what time we have to stop, I'd be grateful. Jan, sir. Um, so one question just about the EU itself rather than anything to do with Britain. Um, the EU currently is in a sort of strange limbo between it's way more than a free trade agreement, but way less than a federal state. And part of the reason it seems to be in that limbo is because of the unanimity rule where every member state has to agree on everything. Um, do the panel agree that this rule holds back Europe or if it's a vital part of its um, functioning? If so, should it be repealed? How might we get a more integrated and decisive Europe? And is scrapping that rule part of that? Thank you. Can we briefly come back to our panellists? Just no. one point each, please. Don't answer all the questions. I want to fill in as many more points on the floor as possible. Let's start this time on my, on my right. Uh, Frederick, yeah. There is too many points. Just Pick, pick uh, one or two. <laughs> um, I mean, if you... I go back to the question of Marine Le Pen. Um, Marine Le Pen, who, who got 21% on the first round and 60 and 30 for on the second round, one <coughs> wanted to destroy Europe and, uh, and the market economy. And uh, the first consequence of the election that we destroyed the National Front because they are now in very big trouble and, uh, and uh, actually all of them are fighting against each other. So at least it is a good uh, outcome of an election that became, began on a very bad way. Um, ah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, very briefly, I think uh, the first question was about free movement, EU free movement law, and that's an issue that I've been uh, teaching for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, just a simple point, uh, those who tend to demand uh, reform or changes regarding EU free movement law tend also to deeply misunderstand it. Um, uh, most people, in my experience, uh, discussing EU free movement law in newspapers don't know what they're talking about. Uh, the simple fact is that EU free movement law uh, does not guarantee an absolute right to claim benefits or an absolute right to reside anywhere in Europe. That's not true. What EU free movement law does, is, essentially, is one key thing. To, uh, to, for anyone exercising their free movement right, then this, they, are, are, they can benefit for the principle of equal treatment. So essentially what EU law does is, once you work in another EU member state than your own, you cannot be discriminated against. That's it. There is no right, absolute right to claim, to travel within Europe and claim benefits. Uh, that's simply not true. I, th I would just refer to uh, a, a brief 10 Q&A uh, I wrote on EU free movement law on the myth uh, mostly propagated by uh, British uh, newspapers. So if you type my name and, uh, online and uh, search for EU free movement law in 10 questions okay. and answers, then you get all the myths completely destroyed <laughs> as efficiently as, as possible, at least. Uh, Thank you. Louise. Well, we had an interesting point on whether or not the EU can now finally renew itself now that Britain, who's been problematic for decades, is finally leaving. Yes and no. We have actually, Britain, pushed. It was a British commissioner who pushed for the single market, for breaking down all these free movement barriers. We've been very active on competition. I worked on international trade, and our international trade negotiators were some of the most powerful in breaking down barriers to trade between Europe and the rest of the world. So on that side of things, I think renewal will be slightly harder. Um, but yes, to the broader, the Euro, um, foreign affairs, home and justice and security, perhaps now Europe will finally be able to deepen on those issues. Right. Okay, can I say, Joseph? I, I think there, there is a recognition in, in the EU that they do need to renew and to, to an extent reinvent themselves. And if you look at the white paper published by the Commission uh, as, as a result so coinciding with the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome a few weeks ago, they mention a few areas and, and it ranges from either remaining as they are 
going back to the European Economic Community, a trading bloc and a, a commercial uh, organization, to federalism at the other end, or to a, this idea of a multi-speed Europe, where some countries can integrate faster than others. All of them pose their different challenges, and it's, it's, it's difficult to see which one is going, to, is, is going to emerge. But certainly my understanding, my impression seems to be that the Commission seems to be favoring this multi-speed approach, where some countries can move faster than other countries. But even that would bring problems. We just need to wait and see. Richard. Question that hasn't been answered on interrail tickets for young people. Great idea, but I don't think there'd be a majority in the European Parliament for it when it adopts the budget, because most members think it's not a good use of taxpayers' money. We'd get a lot of flack for it. On the question of globalization, a different form of globalization, to a degree, the EU is just that. It's the world's largest market, but it's a market with rules rules on consumer protection, rules on workplace rights to protect workers, rules on environmental standards, rules on competition policy to make sure that it's not dominated by multinational companies and you can take them to task. Now, some of us would like to see those rules strengthened, but their existence doesn't apply in other forms of globalization. It's one of the things that makes the EU unique. And may I just say one thing on freedom of movement? Anybody who's been out campaigning knows that immigration is a very difficult and sensitive issue. But the reason that the rest of the European Union doesn't quite understand our obsession with EU freedom of movement, there are three reasons. One, most migrants in Britain have come from outside the European Union, entirely under British rules, nothing to do with EU rules. Second, EU freedom of movement is reciprocal, it's two-way. There are nearly two million Brits in other EU countries. And it's not an unconditional right. You have to meet certain conditions to exercise it, like having a job or a realistic chance of getting one or being self-sufficient. Britain, unlike other EU countries, doesn't enforce those conditions. That's our fault, not the European Union's fault. And finally, they say, and why don't you take the domestic measures that you could take as a country where there are genuine pressures that have built up in different localities, uh, enforce workers' rights, enforce the minimum wage, help those local authorities where there are pressures on services. You could do that like other countries okay. do. That's why there is little sympathy for our demands to end freedom of movement. Oh. This, this panel began 10 minutes late. Are we allowed to have another couple of quick, quick questions? We're not. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Apologies to those still queuing up to us. I'm very, very sorry. Let's try and talk in the coffee break. But thank you for all, to all our panelists. Thank you, Charles. Thank you.